as we prepare to listen to for today's segment on the sanctuary, let us remember that we can take Christ's yoke upon us, for it is gentle, humble in heart, and that we can drop all of our burdens and trials at the cross. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You will find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke. song. That text, uh, as you know, is very special to me. I was in the process of taking my life when I was 20 years old when God broke into my world with that text. And um, I made the decision to give God a try. That, um, That text has special meaning to me. The Sabbath also has uh, special meaning to me, has special meaning to a number of us here. Uh, my, my wife on her cell phone has a, an app, I guess it's called an app, that um, <clears throat> it randomly reminds you of what you were doing a year ago today. And a year ago this Sabbath, we were in Cuba preaching our last presentation there. And, uh, and God, God brought 90 people. 90 people came to the Lord through those meetings. And 35 were baptized a year ago this last Sabbath. And, or this Sabbath, excuse me. And that was precious. And uh, so I had two wonderful reminders today of God's goodness. I also want to remind the congregation that the sermons that are preached here, the messages given, uh, can be found on the website. And I uh, encourage you to share those with others as well. If you miss a message, you can catch up. 
Today's message um, is one that's very near and dear to me, um, and, it, and it has to do with the judgment. And I, I shared with you the reason I studied um, the sanctuary was to understand how God frees us from sin. You know, there's a lot of preachers out there that are teaching that God is going to save you in your sin. The Bible doesn't line up with that. The mission of Christ, when the angel spoke to Joseph, was that he will save his people from. Sin is rebellion against God. And those in heaven, when the rebellion began, were cast out. Nobody is going in rebelling. This is ridiculous. Are you with me? And, and, and unless we understand that one point, we're not going to understand our need of Christ. We're not going to see it. We're not going to recognize it. Sin is rebellion against love. And the government of God would not be safe admitting people in who are rebelling against love. And so God devised a plan by which to save us. And I, I knew this, but I didn't know how to get there from here. And so the sanctuary became of interest to me. And as I studied the sanctuary, what really interested me was the judgment. And the reason the judgment interested me is because there are so many things out there said about the judgment and much of it conflicts with what the Bible reveals about a loving God. And so people really fear the judgment. And so I decided to study the judgment. Now, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a snapshot of the things that I have learned about the judgment. But what I can tell you, two things emerged in my study of the judgment that really fascinated me. You need to understand that in, in this conflict between Christ and Satan, that God is also on trial. And if you haven't figured that out by now, study the life of Job. And that whole exchange in the beginning, really, it's not just Job that's on trial. It was God on trial too. God is on trial because... Uh, the sin experiment began in his backyard. It spilled over onto our world. But this whole sin thing started in his backyard. And there's a big question or not whether God can be trusted. And each of us has to answer that question. I can't answer that question for you. Everybody in this room has to answer that question, has to get that answer for themselves. But And so for me, studying the sanctuary and more specifically the judgment was really my pursuit to know God. And what I discovered in the judgment that really amazed me were two things. Number one is that um, God is very transparent. He's not holding things back. He's very transparent. I learned that truth loses nothing by investigation. Truth welcomes, inv invites investigation. It risks nothing. Error does not want to be investigated. But truth welcomes investigation. God is incredibly transparent and makes himself vulnerable in the process. The other thing that really amazed me, and I, and I, and I, and I want to add frightens me, and it'll come out in this, in the study, is that God is extremely respectful of our freedom of choice. The Lord will not mess with our freedom of choice. God will never use force. Or, coer or coercion. Never. He is transparent. He is respectful of our freedom of choice. I couldn't serve anyone else than him. Amen. For those two reasons. I, uh, in, in part, there are more. But what I'd like to do now, though, is I would like uh, for us to pray together to approach the throne of grace one more time. Uh, because I am a a, 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 a frail, mortal instrument, and I am fearful of getting in the way of what God wants you to hear today. And so I'd like for you to join me, and, I want to, and, and I'm going to give you a, an opportunity to pray. I want you to pray for yourselves, and I, then I want you to pray for me in your hearts. Okay? So as far as possible, let's kneel. Oh, Father, I was just touched by that special music. And re just remember where, what you pulled me out of. 
I thank you for your kindness. And I never dreamt of where you would lead me. And Lord, as we gather here today, this is a very sensitive topic that the devil has really warped. And, um, and Lord, you know, some, uh, sometimes I, I, I assume things. And, uh, and Lord, I, that can't happen today. I, I really need you, Father, to present exactly what you want spoken here today in the illustrations, the text, the whole thing. You know, I have planned the best I know how, but it's not good enough. And so we are praying for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I, you brought us here today for, for this reason. Uh, there have been, may have been other reasons and excuses, but behind it all, it was you that brought us here. And so I pray that we will hear you and not the voice of a frail, broken mortal. I pray, Lord, that the blood of Christ will wash away the sins of every one of us. And that truly his righteousness will cover us, that your presence will be allowed here, Lord, without placing us in any kind of jeopardy. That you will commune with us. Everyone in this room, Lord, has a different way of learning, has a different issue. Father, there are some here that have been growing deaf to your voice. They need to hear it today. And so I pray, Lord, that truly we will hear the voice from the throne room appealing to our hearts. May we have a correct picture of your character and of the process of the judgment. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. Your promise that when we call, that you would answer and we do so now. And I'd like to give each here just a moment, Lord, to pray for themselves, that they will hear you today but also that they'll pray for the speaker, that he will not get in the way. Thank you, Father. And now we ask that you will truly shut us in the secret place of the Most High and that your angels of light will encircle us and keep the evil one away and that, Lord, we'll remember to silence our cell phones. I thank you as we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been studying about the Day of Atonement. We have been learning that what went on in the sanctuary on earth was a play out of what was happening in the heavenly sanctuary in heaven. That you and I obviously can't be in the heavenly sanctuary, but God gave us a model on earth so that we can understand what's going on up there. God wants us engaged. It is vital that we are engaged. So the, the Day of Atonement on earth was only a shadow that pointed forward to the Day of Atonement that would take place in heaven. And that day is known as the Judgment. On Daniel chapter 8, we looked at a prophecy found in verse 14, the 2300-day prophecy. And that prophecy marked the beginning of the Judgment. And we discovered that that began in the fall of 1844. More specifically, by the way, we'll talk about it more in a later study, but uh, in in 1844, the Day of Atonement fell on October 22. And we have studied already that, uh, that the festivals in the sanctuary were an incredible prophetic timeline of the plan of salvation and that God was not only concerned with the day in which things happened, but right down to the hour. So we can rest assured that the judgment in heaven began on October 22, 1844. Today, what we're going to focus in on is the operation of the judgment. There's a tremendous amount of ignorance as to what the judgment is about. And... And a lot of that ignorance, I think, is really based on fear. We're afraid. You know, we, you probably run into a lot of folks that will tell you, yeah, October 22, 1844, the judgment began. But beyond that, that's it. 
I don't know any more about what's involved. We're going to look at that today. Um, but it's interesting that the judgment, the whole idea of the judgment is very deeply rooted in the scriptures. Uh, most of the books of the Bible refer to the judgment, and yet how little of it we hear in the Christian world today. In fact, Jesus made many references to the judgment in his, in his parables. In fact, some of the greatest climaxes of his most well-known parables had to do with the judgment. When you study the judgment in the Bible, you'll find that the Bible writers had a very unique perspective on the judgment. They did not view it as bad news. They didn't fear it. They viewed it as good news. To the Bible writer, they recognized that part that the judgment was actually part of the redemptive process. They recognized that. How many of you have ever read the book of Judges? You will notice that in the book of Judges, what is it about? That God raised up judges for what purpose? To deliver God's oppressed people. The judgment is about deliverance. Now, if that's true, that the devil wants you studying it. He wants you afraid of it. But the judgment is about deliverance. The judgment, my friends, proves that God is a moral God and that our universe has a moral base. The judgment promises the ultimate exposure and condemnation of evil and the ultimate vindication of righteousness and truth. You know, I grew up in L.A., in my neighborhood, the police wouldn't come. Uh, I went, uh, we often went to bed hearing gunshots. That was the norm. You don't ever want to live somewhere where there is no law. Law is good. Our God is a moral God. And so what I'd like to do, you have your lessons with you. I'd like to begin unpacking this. And our, our, our message today is entitled, The Good News of the Judgment. We're going to learn that the judgment is actually a three-part process. And today, we're going to look at the investigative judgment. I love this painting here by Harry Anderson. And you see the great standard of uh, the judgment there. And you see the man there. And who does he have by his side? He has his friend, Jesus. I want you to keep that picture in your mind today. So let's take a look at question number one. Can we be certain there will be a judgment? What does the Bible say? Acts 17, 31. God has appointed what? A day. Thank you, uh, audience, for, for speaking up on those underlined and highlighted words. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. That's in the Bible, friends. God has appointed a day. And in Daniel 8, we discovered that that day falls on the fall of 1844. So that tells us that judgment is underway as we're sitting here today. People keep putting it off to the future. Uh, no, it's underway now. Uh, let's take a look at question number two. How does Daniel describe the judgment scene when Jesus moves from the holy place to the most holy? Because remember... We talked about the fact that when Christ came to earth, the outer court represented his ministry here, right? That he died. Uh, he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But on his resurrection, he went back up to heaven, remember? When John was in vision, he saw in, the, in the book of Revelation, and he sees Jesus, where is Jesus standing? Do you remember? By the candlestick. He's by the candlesticks in vision. So when Jesus went to heaven, he began his ministration in the holy place. But on October 22, 1844, there was a change in his ministry and he went into the most holy place. Okay? You with me so far? And so what you're going to see in Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel, the book of Daniel, remember we talked about it was the book of judgment. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Daniel chapter 7, he actually envisioned gets to see the judgment before it happens. 
But what, but the picture that he, he, uh, reveals here is a picture of a process. You're gonna see a lot of activity taking place. And, and actually what he is seeing is when the judgment begins. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is what we're about to read is what Daniel saw was going to happen on October 22, 1844. Watch, it's very interesting. I watched until thrones were put in place. Were they in place before? No. Did you catch that? I watched till thrones were put in place. And the ancient of days was? What was he before? He was standing. His garment was white as snow. His hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels. Ooh, interesting. What does wheels tell us about the throne? It's movable. Okay, so it was coming from another location. A burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. Remember all the angels that we see in the tabernacle. The what? The court was seated. And the books were open. They weren't open before. So this is showing us that judgment is beginning. By the way, we're going to talk a little bit about those books because the Bible does reference these books. All right, our next, we're continuing on now. I was watching in the night vision and behold one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. What we're seeing here is the antitypical Day of Atonement. This is the the, the type was on earth. You remember that the, on earth, the high priest came into the presence of God, into the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. Do you remember that? What we're seeing here are, is our great high priest entering into the presence of his father for the final phase of his ministry in the salvation of man. The Day of Atonement was the last of the festivals that were involved in the plan of salvation. The only one after that is the Feast of Tabernacles, and that one is a celebration because the deal is over. We're going to study about that as well. Uh, but let's continue. Number three. <clears throat> Who will be brought into this judgment? Second Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, do you know how much of all involves all? All. No exceptions. You know, when I grew up in, uh, in Los Angeles, it wasn't an uncommon scene to see uh, police officers approach a door, knock on the door, and the person open the door, and they receive a subpoena. It's a rather unnerving experience. You can imagine, how would you feel if you opened your front door and there was the sheriff's department and they hand you a subpoena? I would imagine that... Um, you're going to start asking some questions. You're going to want to know when the court date is. You want to, you're going to want to know what the charges are. Isn't that right? And you're going to want to get your hands on a good lawyer. Isn't that true? My friends, you and I have received our subpoena. We all have a court date. Every one of us. But before all is said and done, I'm going to point you to a fantastic lawyer. Let's keep going. Number four. With which class will the judgment begin? First Peter 4.17 For the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, there's an interesting question that uh, Peter asked. If it begins with us, what will be the end of those who did not obey the gospel? Isn't that interesting? He's saying, but basically what he's saying is, if it begins with us, obviously those that it doesn't begin with are going to be lost. That's what he's saying. Now, <clears throat> why does it begin in the house of God? You know, all of us here, um, oh, we're born with a fallen nature. Oh, I hope you stay with me on this. Just because you're born with a fallen nature doesn't make you a sinner. 
sin involves a choice. Remember, the Bible says that sin is a transgression of the law. That involves a choice. And when you were born into this sinful world, what law did you break? There isn't, there isn't a conscious mind there. But what we do have is a propensity for evil. We have a natural bent. And, and as a result, all of us have sinned. And now we are sinners. Are you with me? But it involves a conscious choice. And, and so as a result, we are all doomed to die. The wages of sin is, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we need a solution. And that solution is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But to receive it takes a choice. It involves a choice. I have to be willing to allow Jesus to take my place and to take my sin. And then I have to be willing to take his righteousness. Does this make sense? And so in the sanctuary, the sanctuary taught that, that I, I was to confess my sin over the innocent victim. And in so doing, that sin was transferred on to the lamb. The lamb's life was taken then. They paid the penalty, or the, the ultimate price for my sin. The lamb did. Christ did. And then that blood was transferred into the sanctuary, symbolically teaching me that now my record of sin is stored in the heavenly sanctuary. And right next to the sin is the word pardoned in red. Does that make sense? And so what, what happens, the reason, and so the person who doesn't accept Jesus, there is no pardon next to their sin. And so they're automatically lost. Open your Bibles. We're going to review this real quick. Uh, turn to the book of John, and it's a very familiar verse. We looked at it in the last sermon. We'll look at it again, John chapter 3. And uh, we're going to begin with a, uh, a very familiar verse that we all know of, but but we've got to follow carefully what's saying here, what, what is being said here, because what I just shared with you is in these verses. I'm going to read uh, John 3, 16, 17, and 18. So I'm beginning in verse 16. John 3, 16. And we all know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't send his son to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. The wages of sin is death. But now this is brought out in verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned how? Already. Does, does this make sense? Are you with me so far? This is very, very important. So, so, the, the, so in phase one in the investigative judgment, it only involves those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So what I'm trying to say is, you want to be in the investigative judgment. You want to be part of that. Let's take a look. Number five. <clears throat> who is the prosecuting attorney? Revelation 12, 9 and 10 says, The great dragon called the devil and Satan the accuser of the brethren. By the way, this, uh, this, this, this tells us that the devil evidently keeps records too. He keeps them. And, um, <clears throat> and so what the devil does is he's the accuser. You know, this is really important because how often we have been afraid of the father in the judgment. As though he was the big heavy. Somehow we have this picture of God, try, the father trying to figure out a way to keep us out of heaven and Jesus desperately trying to keep us there. It's like some dysfunctional family picture. You know, this is the picture I had and it was probably because of my Catholic upbringing. That, that I just saw Jesus, you know, trying to shield me and the father out there uh, trying to get at me. Just give me two minutes with it. No, no, not him. This, this is not, this is diabolical. This is not a picture of our God in heaven. Open your Bibles. Let's turn to the book of John. John chapter 16. Let's get an accurate picture. Let's get a biblical picture. And not this warped picture that Satan has pawned off as truth 
in the Christian world has bought into it. Let's see what the word says. John 16. If you're there, say amen. And I'm going to read verse 27. Look at the first five words. For the Father himself loves you. Dear friend, God is not trying to find a way to keep you out of heaven. He's doing everything possible to try to get you in. Everything possible to try to get you in. He's not trying to find a way to get you out. God is not the accuser. It, the devil's the accuser. I want to show you another text. Open up to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12. So let's go back here. Luke chapter 12. If you're there, say amen. I still hear pages turning. Luke chapter 12. And uh, the verse we're going to read is, is in red. The words are in red. What does that tell us? Jesus' words. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We cannot forget, friends, that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave, he gave everything in his son. God is not the big heavy. The devil is. But we're going to discover in this study that God, not only is God not the one we're supposed to fear in the judgment, we're going to discover that, it, we're not supposed to, that the devil isn't the one we're supposed to fear. But there is a fear factor, and we're going to take a look at what it is. Take a look at number six. Who is the defense attorney? First John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. That another word for advocate is lawyer. With the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So there's a prosecuting attorney, but there's also a defense attorney. And the Bible tells us in John 15, 15, it says that Jesus says, I do not call you servants, but friends. And more than that, he is the brother of our race. He is flesh and blood, too. So, friend, how would you like to show up on court day and look up and find that your best friend is your lawyer? One amen. Thank you. <laughs> your best friend is your lawyer. By the way, you know that here on earth, if you are summoned to court, you don't actually have to be there. Your lawyer can represent you. How many of you knew that? Okay, your lawyer can represent you without you being there. It's the same deal with the court that's, that's taking place in heaven. Jesus is there representing us. Open your Bible to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Hebrews chapter 9. If you're there, say amen. And, um, and in this verse, uh, you know, in, in, in chapter 8, Paul is talking about Jesus, our great high priest, entering the heavenly sanctuary. In verse 9, he begins talking about uh, the various uh, activities in the sanctuary, the daily as well as the yearly, which is the Day of Atonement. But take a look at verse 24. It says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is representing us in this courtroom scene. Very, very important. Let's continue on. So now, so now we've discovered we just walked in and we did to the court scene, just discovered that our, our friend, our brother is our judge, excuse me, is our lawyer. But it gets better. Take a look at the next verse. This next one is a whopper, by the way. Number seven, who is the judge? John 522 says, for the father judges. Stop. What did you just say? Did you catch that? That's in your Bible, by the way. The Father judges no one. Let's continue. But has committed all judgment to the Son. Who's the judge? Jesus. So now check this out. You just showed up to court. Not only... 
is your best friend, your brother, your attorney. He's the judge. Does this sound stacked? If we trust him, he will not lose a case. If we trust him, he will not lose a case. By the way, so this means that the father is present, but he is what you refer to as the presiding judge. Okay, he has the highest ranking, but he is the presiding judge, but has given all of the judgment to his son. So now he is the acting judge. Are you with me? Very, very important uh, to pick up on this. Okay, number, number eight. <clears throat> Our study of the Bible will reveal three phases to the judgment. The first one is what we're looking at right now is phase one is the investigation of the righteous, which began in 1844. And uh, if found not guilty, they are then acquitted. By the way, you notice I didn't say the word they're innocent. I, I avoided that one. There's the difference, isn't there? If found not guilty, they are acquitted. Let's turn in our Bibles real quick. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. <clears throat> if you're there, say amen. <clears throat> in this verse, we're going to look at the word judgment in this sense is used in the context of condemnation, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. John uh, 5.24 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, who's the him here? It's Jesus who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death to, to life. And so uh, in, the, in the investigation, if, if they're found not guilty, then uh, they are acquitted. However, uh, if they are found guilty, then they proceed to phase two and three. In phase two and three, uh, we have those who did not choose Christ. Okay. And, uh, and so, uh, phase two, we're going to learn, is the sentencing stage. Uh, how many of you have heard of the millennium? The, the millennium has not been taught right. The millennium has to be taught in the context of the sanctuary. And we're going to find out that the millennium has everything to do with the sentencing stage. Very interesting. Then there's the last stage, phase three, which is the executive portion of the, uh, of the judgment, which is the carrying out of what was, what was decided in the sentencing stage. Does this make sense? That's the execution. And we're going to study that again because there, uh, th th that, that whole teaching has been warped as well. But the Bible, my friends, are you beginning to learn, are you beginning to realize that if you do not study Bible for yourself, if you do not study for yourself, you are likely believing some pretty wacky stuff, thinking it's truth. Uh, Hitler said if you repeat a lie long enough, it will eventually be embraced as truth. You, you have got to be in the Word for yourself. Even the things I'm sharing with you, you've got to study for yourself. You can't trust your soul to this preacher. Very, very important. Okay, number, uh, number nine. <clears throat> what books are talked about in Daniel 7.10? Remember, we talked about the books are open. The Bible refers to three of them. The first is found in Jeremiah 2.22, and, uh, is re and, and it is the book of iniquity or of sin. And here we find in Jeremiah 2.22, it says, you, uh, Yet you are what? Iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord of God, the, the, says the Lord God. So it's marked. It's recorded. Did you get that? The second, the book of remembrance, Malachi 3.16. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. And as we go a little more and it, we're going to talk, touch on the book of remembrance a little more, we're going to find that it really records all the good deeds that we have done in our life. So uh, one book records all the bad deeds and the other one records all the good deeds. You're with me so far. All right. And then number three, another book that the Bible refers to is the book of life. Revelation 3, 5 says, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. By the way, this right here alludes to something. Our names, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, our names are automatically placed in the book of life. When we give our lives to Jesus, when we ask him into our lives, into our life, our names are automatically enrolled in the book of life. 
At that very moment, when you ask Jesus into your life as your Savior, I can just picture, I'm a very, you know, I have an overactive imagination, but I, I picture Jesus turning to an angel and say, get a crown ready for him. Get a crown ready for her. Now, the devil's job is to see to it that you never wear that crown. Are you with me? So the key, the key is to keep our name in the book of life. And we're going to talk about that. It's placed there, but we've got to keep it there. Um, let's take a look at number 10. <clears throat> What is the standard by which all will be judged? Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the, this is the wisest man who ever lived. These are the words of Solomon. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. By the way, I like that. Are you like, I'm a bottom line kind of person. So let's just cut to the chase. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, that means respect him. He doesn't, not, not to be afraid of him because you're not gonna, you're not gonna trust someone you're afraid of. <laughs> right? Fear God, respect God, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. And again, James 2.13, So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The, big, the great standard in the judgment, I hope you're with me on this, is the law. It's the Ten Commandments of God. That's the standard of the judgment. We have learned in our studies that the Ten Commandments is a transcript of the character of God. It reveals to us who God is in written form. But Jesus came into this world to show us what God is like. Jesus is actually a living example of the law written on the heart. So we have the law in written form and we have Christ, the law in living form. That's the standard of the judgment. So what are you saying, Pastor? Simply this. Follow me now. There is only one question asked in the judgment. Did this person, did this man, this woman keep my commandments? That's the only question asked. Are you beginning to see now why we need Jesus Christ? We need a new path, friends. And Jesus is willing to give us a new path, his path, his perfect path. Not only do we need a, a new path, we need the power of God in our lives so that we can live above the power of sin today. Because without it, we don't even have a desire to do so. Now, listen to me. If there's anyone here that is toying with the idea of adultery or is involved in it right now, get away from it. You're going to lose your soul. If there's anyone here who, is in, who finds themselves in the grips of pornography, if you don't get away from that, it's going to cost you your eternal life. That's not going into heaven. Are you with me? Listen, I understand the addiction. I understand the struggle, be it that sin or any other. But if you do not recognize it for what it is, an obstacle for you to get into, into the kingdom, if you do not recognize it, you're not going to get away from it and you're going to find out too late. There's no games. If, if we are, are conveniently making excuses for working on God's Sabbath, if we're doing that, we're actually going against the sign of the covenant. We have to understand that sin was cast out. It's not coming back in. Sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is rebellion. Sin is not a mistake. It's a conscious choice. Does that make sense? If, if, I, if I pull the ripcord of a little white lie whenever I'm in a pickle, I am placing my salvation in jeopardy. God cannot allow that in. Are, are you with me? There is only one question asked in the judgment. Did this person keep my law? And when you look at the Ten Commandments, it's an expression of love. It's not a burden. Don't kill people. That's a burden. There are issues if that's a burden. Be faithful to your spouse. That's a burden. You know, I am so thankful that we serve a God that can transform our lives. As, as that song was sung today, that, that hymn, you have no idea what my life was like before. Even my wife doesn't fully know what my life was like before. 
And but my wife will tell you that I'm not the person she married. God has so changed my and he's continuing. I haven't arrived. You can ask my wife that one, too. But I'm heading for higher ground. God is transforming my life. Are you with me? I'm exhibit A. If, if, if there's anybody in this room, which there isn't, unfortunately, but maybe there's a visitor here today who grew up with me. You can come up here and bear witness. This is not the same man. But I, I can't take credit for that. And we're going to talk about how God, yeah, God got me there. But it's God who's, tra- who's transforming my life. My point, the reason I'm saying this is this. Don't make an excuse for continuing to sin when help is available. That's why God risked eternal loss was to set you free. That's why he came here to set me free. Number 11. What will the judgment bring to light? Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every what? You know, in the judgment, when we, God willing, one day when we arrive, in, uh, in, in, in heaven, uh, there's going to be some people there that we, ex- there's going to be some people missing that we expected to be there. What happened to Pastor so and so or Elder so and so? They were such godly people. How in the world are they not here? And then God is going to say, here's their book. And when the book is open, we're going to find that Elder or Pastor so and so was living a double life. In front of everybody, they were one thing, but behind the scenes, When no one was watching, there was something else. And we're going to see all the times that God tried to reach that dear soul and how many times they 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 pushed God away. And at the very end of looking at the book, we're going to we're going to say, well, Lord. What more could you have done? God respects our choices. And so every idle word, every you know, I'm going to share something with you. And I shared in the past. There's a lot in my past that I'm ashamed of. There are things that I have done that I, I just won't even repeat to anyone. I'm ashamed. I wish I'd never done it. And at the very end, when you go to open up the book to see that part of my life, it's not going to be there because the blood of Christ would have washed it away. Okay? Nobody's going to see that. The blood of Jesus washes that all away. Just want you to know that. The other thing is, is every idle word, Matthew 12, 26 and 27, I, I remember a friend once saying, if you don't want to face it in the judgment, don't say it. By the way, how can you break uh, the Ten Commandments with words? Well, one obviously would be lying. But, you know, you can murder with words. It's called gossip. You know, we've heard of character assassination. That's a type of murder. So we've got to be careful what we say. Number 12. <clears throat> what is Jesus seeking to accomplish in his followers through the judgment process? Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Man, that's a gift. Do you realize that? Jesus gave himself to the human race. That he might sanctify, that means put aside for holy use, and what? Cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be what? Holy and without what? Blemish. And what we're looking at here is actually sanctuary terminology. You remember that when the repentant Hebrew brought his lamb, that lamb had to be inspected. And it had to be without what? Spot or blemish. And what, okay, so the lamb represented Christ. What spot and blemish represent? Sin. Jesus was a perfect sacrifice. By the way, when did Jesus receive his inspection? Do you realize on the Passover, before the Passover lamb was, life was taken, the, the lamb had to be inspected. Jesus was the Passover lamb. When was Jesus inspected? He was inspected by Pilate. Do you remember he turned to the people and he said, I find no fault in him. Perfect sacrifice. And so Jesus wants to accomplish that in us. That's his goal for his church. To give them the victory over the power of sin. 
You know, friend, there's only one sin that God cannot give us victory over. It's the one we don't want him to give us victory over. Or the one we don't believe he can give us victory over. Is the devil more powerful than God? Really? No, he is not. Now, it is true that some sins are going to involve a battle royale. If you've ever been involved in addiction, it's going to be a battle royale. But if you trust Christ and you cooperate with him, he will set you free. I've seen it. I'm in the business, friend. I see it all the time. But I also run into people. I remember one lady. We were trying to help her get victory over cigarettes. And she looked me in the face and she said, I'd rather have my cigarettes than Jesus. You know, I at least appreciate the fact that she articulated it. But there are other ways we can say the same thing without actually using those words. Isn't that true? So I looked at the dear sister and I said, you know, I appreciate your honesty. Now I'm going to ask you if you're willing to pray something. Will you say to the Lord, I'm not willing, but I am willing to be made willing. I've had to pray that prayer. And God will hear it if you keep praying it. And, you know, I want to share with you the only way to get victory is by spending time with Christ. It is by beholding that we become changed. You know, the devil doesn't care if we come to church. But the moment you begin to spend time with God in the word, the battle is on. He does not want you spending time with Jesus in his word. But that's where you get victory. It's only in the presence of Jesus that we get it. I'll spend more time on that. It is by beholding we become changed. But ultimately, what God is looking for is people who are fully believe him, fully trust him, and allow him to live out his life, within, will allow us to, to let him live out his life within us. That's what he's looking for. People that will trust him. Number 13. What happens if a sin remains on the books unrepented of and unforsaken? Exodus thirty-two thirty-three says, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Ezekiel 18.24 But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, what's the next word? All the righteous which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which his, uh, he is guilty and the sin that he has committed. He shall what? He shall die. And uh, obviously, God is not standing by the light switch of our lives going, yeah, he's saved. No, he's lost. Oh, you repent, he's saved. So it's, a, it's a process. The destruction of a relationship is a process. Right? And you know, people will meet on the street and go, hey, you know, you, know, you look kind of nice. Let's get married. It's, there's, there's, a, there's a time that you spend together to get to know one another. At least, that's normal. <laughs> You're supposed to get to know each other, right? You know? And uh, so the development of a relationship takes time. The destruction of a relationship also takes time. I want to share this one thing with you. This text used to really bug me. That here I have good works, and, and because I blow it in the end, that that's all taken off my books. I thought, well, uh, wait a second, I thought those were mine. What are you doing with those? Why are you taking them if they're mine? You know why? Because they're not mine. Because you and I are born with a fallen nature, you and I have a natural propensity to evil. Okay? Even when we do the right thing, we've got an angle. That's what, how the fallen nature works. Selfishness rules on the heart. The only way that you and I can actually do the right thing for the right reasons is if Jesus Christ is on our hearts. And so then, so then anything that, puts into, that goes into that book is because of Christ living out his life within me. Before it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, the Bible tells us. So I have nothing to brag about when I do something right. I'm not better than the guy next door. All glory goes to God. All glory and credit goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he does have a right to take those things back. He does. So what this is telling us right here is that there's going to be an investigation into those books to see if, if the person who made the decision for Christ remained with that decision or if they reneged on it. You know, we, we see people on wedding days who, who give, make a vow to death. And we discover a few years later the marriage breaks up maybe because of infidelity or what have you. They didn't carry through. 
And so God gives us all the freedom of choice. And so the books of heaven, you know, do you think God needs books? God does not need books. God knows the future. He knows everything. So then why do we have the books? For the rest of the onlooking universe. They don't want this sin problem to break out in their backyard again. They already went through it once. They want, they have vested interest on who's admitted in. And so they want to make sure that the people who decided for Jesus really did decide for Jesus and remain with that decision. Does that make sense? That's reasonable, isn't it? It really is. All right. Uh, where am I now? Where did I leave you? Let's take a look at my number 14. 14. But what if I have repented of my sin and have turned from it by the grace of God, by the way, and by faith have claimed the blood of Jesus as my atoning sacrifice? Will my sin be blotted out and my name remain in the book of life? Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. Isn't that beautiful? In other words, if we, if we remain humble and yielded to God and trusting Him and remaining with Him, He's going to take care of our case, friends. Let's look at the next verse. Revelation 3, 5. It says, He who what? Overcomes. You know, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's more than overcoming sin. It's overcoming self. That's what it's about. It's, it always amuses me when people say, Oh, Pastor, it's so hard to have morning devotion. I just don't have time. I ask them this. Um, I, don't have time. I don't have the desire and I don't have time. Did you feel like going to work today? Well, no. So you made a decision against your feelings? So then you know how to do that. This is, this is about your eternal life. There's no games here. Church membership isn't going to save you, friends. Only Christ will. And we've got to spend time with Him. He who overcomes self shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out His name from the book of life, but I will confess His name before my Father and before the angels. How cool is that? Open your Bibles. You're getting quiet out there. Let's take a look at the book of Ephesians. Get your pencils out. I want you to underline this. Circle the text. The book of Ephesians and, uh, no, excuse me, Philippians, Philippians, forgive me. Philippians chapter 2. Are you in Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to pick up in verse 12. Therefore, Paul's reaching a conclusion. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. This whole thing about work out your own salvation is so frightening to people. It, it kind of, we kind of t- start thinking about a, a, a works trip. Working out your own salvation, friends, what Paul is saying here is cooperate with God. Cooperate with Him. And as you do, as you cooperate with God, it then gives God the right to work in you. Both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, you remember the story of the paralytic in uh, Beth, uh, the pool of Beth, uh, Bethesda. Bethesda. Thank you. I couldn't get it out. Um, and you remember that brother was in that condition, the Bible says, for 38 years. Did he want to walk? Yeah. Did he try? Was it that he didn't try hard enough? He couldn't walk. Then Jesus came to him and tells, told him, get up. He had to do something. He had to believe that God had the power. And when he made the effort this time, it gave God the right to unleash his power into his life. And that brother walked. Amen. Working out your own salvation, fear of trembling, involves trusting God and cooperating with Him. God then unleashes the power. You with me? Is it making sense? All right. Let's take a look. Uh, is there another verse there? No. Let's take a look at number 15. Is that where I am? Yeah. 
While the investigative judgment is taking place, what is my part? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, what's the first word? Examine yourselves. Stop right there. Isn't that interesting? Examine yourselves. Remember, the books in heaven are being examined. There's an investigation. Now God is calling me to join it, to be part of it. And he asked me to investigate my own life. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. You know, I remember, I've shared this story with you, but I'll, I'll say it a little different. Um, but I remember when um, reading a, uh, a quote from an author that said, you can, if you're a Christian, if you're really a Christian, you're going to be one in your home. You can fool the people at work. You can fool the people at church, but you don't fool the people at home. In other words, your books, your name may be on the books at church, but if you're not respectful to your wife, if you're not kind and patient with your children, then you're not a Christian. Christian means like Christ. And you know, the first time I heard that, um, I, if you'd gone to the church that I was attending at the time, they would have all, and even at work, I had a Bible study going on. Everybody would have told you I was a great Christian. But as I reflected back, I realized that I was not patient with my wife. I wasn't patient with her. I get impatient with her. Sometimes even in groups, I hate to say, I hate to admit this, but sometimes my poor wife's the butt of some of my jokes. And as I reflected, I began to realize I was not reflecting Christ at all. I was not a Christian. And I ask God to change my life, transform me. And he continues to do that. My friends, what I'm saying is, if, if Christianity is not happening in the house, it's not happening. And so Paul is saying, you know, he's not saying ask the church to judge you. He's saying, hey, let's, let's not play games. Examine yourself. But when we do that, what, what do we compare ourselves to? Pastor Baute? We compare ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't compare yourself amongst yourself. You know, when we do that, we tend to compare ourselves to people that we think we're better than. We're funny. We're really, we avoid the people. Or if there's somebody that does appear better than us, we got to find a way to knock them down. And the congregation said, yeah, that's how we roll. No, we're to look to Jesus Christ. He is our model. Our only safe example to follow. And when the Lord does show sin, point out sin in our lives, don't make excuses. Because if we make excuse for sin, God doesn't have any jurisdiction over it. The only way God has jurisdiction, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. But if we excuse it, he has no jurisdiction. And if you remember, on the Day of Atonement, as, 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 as the priest was in here involved in these activities, do you remember what the people outside were supposed to be doing? Afflicting their souls. What does that mean? They were examining their selves. And it was to teach us that on the great Day of Atonement, since 1844, the people of God has got to be examining themselves. Why? Because the high priest is coming out soon, friends. And when he does, we're going home. We are going home. All right. Let's take a look at the note right below that. We must search our own hearts and lives by comparing ourselves with Jesus and his law. We are not irrevocably locked into salvation by one initial or isolated act of believing. We are called to continue in Jesus. There must be a sustained, persevering commitment to him, a continuous personal union with him. And this is accomplished by choosing him as our Lord and Savior every day or daily. The daily, right? All right, let's take a look at the note right below that. <clears throat> Consider, if we combine our understanding of the gospel with what we have learned regarding the judgment, we will have no difficulty understanding the operation of the pre-advent judgment. We, uh, here we will recognize the key importance of the power of choice in our day-to-day -day, day -day lives. So what I'm going to do from now on is I'm going to read straight through. Get your pencils handy. 
And uh, we're going we're gonna, to gonna be a little review here, what we learned so far in the sanctuary. And number one refers to the outer court. Our initial choice to receive Christ by faith puts us in Christ. At the moment of our initial commitment, Jesus gives us the legal right to live forever with him. That is known as justification. All right. That's the outer court experience. Right. We come to Jesus. Remember the gate. He's the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. We accept him as a sacrifice. And then the water represents baptism. That's a commitment. So when we ask him to forgive us for our sins, give us a new past, at that juncture, that's what uh, scholars refer to as justification. At that moment, we have a legal right to live with him forever. By the way, if Hitler had repented after killing millions of people, if, if down in his heart he really repented and asked God for forgiveness, he would have been forgiven. So if there's anybody here that thinks you've gone too far, you're wrong. God is a bigger forgiver than you are a sinner. So, so the first thing, the outer court, that's justification. But remember, it doesn't end there. If it's true justification, it leads to sanctification. And that's, that's the other half of the coin. That takes place in the holy place. That's what the holy place teaches us. Let's continue. Numbers 2 and 3. Tell us about the holy place. Our sustained habitual faith choices to keep on receiving him keeps us in Christ in a state of perfect security. Number three, conscientiously and deliberately, we must renew our surrender to Jesus control on a day to day, moment by moment basis. Let me pause there. That control is voluntary. God never forces his way into the life. The Bible refers to that as surrender. Okay, let's continue. This is what the Bible means by abiding in him, continuing in the faith, enduring unto the end, keeping ourselves in the love of God and holding fast the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end. And as we maintain our connection with Christ, he is transforming us all the time. That's the sanctification process. By beholding, we become changed. I'm going to share with you an illustration. I'm going to ask Brother Jacob if he will come up here. <clears throat> All right. Just stand there. I have a problem. Um, it's raining. Okay, let's say rain is sin. Right? It's coming down. I am soaked. You with me? I have no solution to my problem. But I want to be dry. I want it. But I don't know how to get there. Then my friend Jesus shows up and I see he has an umbrella and he calls me to him. Okay, and I accept the invitation and I come to my friend Jesus. And then he and I begin walking together. Now, while we're walking together, what's happening to me? It didn't happen instantly. Are you listening? I'm drying. It's a process. We're walking together. Uh, then, uh, after a while, suddenly I realize... I have victory. I'm dry. Jesus, thank you so much. I appreciate that. What happens? You see, victory over sin is never something that Jesus gives us apart from himself. Jesus is my victory. I only have victory as long as I'm with Jesus. As I'm walking with him. Now, now, who's holding the umbrella? He is, not me. So what does that mean? That means wherever Jesus goes, if I want to remain under the umbrella in his protection, I got to go where he goes. I got to go where he leads me. I got to marry who he tells me to marry. I got to move wherever he tells me to move. I got to work where he tells me to work. Are, are you with me? I now allow him to be the guide of my life, not me. That was the best decision I ever made. Best decision I ever made. Saved my marriage. Saved my life. Best decision I ever made. Thank you. I, I, I tell people that it is critical that we remain under the umbrella of Christ. Go with Jesus. Follow Jesus. Trust Jesus. Let's keep going. Number four. Now, now we're going to talk about the fear factor. Let's get real now. Now the fear factor. We all learned it's not the Father. He's not even judging. Right? Didn't we learn that? Watch this. One factor 
And one factor alone can jeopardize our security and take us out of Christ. And that is our own will. Our own decision to do things how? Our way. Ever, ever felt smarter than God? Oh, yeah, about four people are honest in this room. One, so one element of risk remains, but that lies within ourselves. While no man or demon or circumstance can destroy our security in Jesus, we can destroy that security by carelessness or perversity or neglect. We can do that. We have to make sure to leave Jesus on the throne of our hearts and follow him as he is the one holding the umbrella. Number five, accordingly, when our individual cases are reviewed in the judgment, before Jesus comes to bring his reward with him, only one matter will need to be investigated. Did this man or woman continue to abide in Jesus? Remembering that an abiding relationship with Jesus is always manifested in a life of, of obedience to his Ten Commandments. Why? Because you and I cannot obey any other way. My friends, I, I, I just want to be really honest here. But church membership will save no one. Club membership doesn't save anybody. If we do not have a living connection with Jesus day by day, we're lost in the church. We're not spending time with him in his word on our knees every day when we start our day. It doesn't matter how many offices you hold in the church, you're lost in the church. It's just that simple. Jesus is the only one who can save us. And you know, each day, each day, the little decisions we make, when we say yes to Jesus, we're giving him a little bit more space in our heart. And we're training. Did you hear the word I use? What's the word to say together, family? Training our mind to respond to him positively. When, when, when we know that God wants us to do something and we make the choice to do it, we're training our mind to obey him. But the opposite is also true. That when we know what God wants us to do and we choose not to do it, we're training our mind to ignore the voice. And the Bible refers to that as the unpardonable sin. Eventually, we'll come to the place we won't hear that voice anymore. So, so the key is to continue to be saying yes to Jesus. You know, it's really interesting. <clears throat> God, God gives us choices, friends. You know, in, in, in the antediluvian world was facing the judgment of its generation. And God, there was going to be destruction by flood. And God put a boat out there and he opened the door and anybody could walk in who wanted to. They could have come in. They could have walked in. Anybody could have walked in. It was open. They could have walked in. But they chose not to. They had various reasons. They didn't want to give up their fun. What they thought was fun anyway. The devil makes it look like fun. And at the end, you're, you're left holding a mess. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, they didn't want to give up their job. Maybe it would cost them their job if they went in. It wasn't convenient. Well, the day came when the storm was coming. The door had to be closed. And once the door was closed, it was closed. When the rain began to fall, how logical did all those excuses then appear? My friend, there's another storm coming. Our world is about to face its final crisis. When we turn on the news... We are seeing the rumbling of distant thunder. The storm is coming. Now is the day of salvation. I plead. I plead with all here. There is no good excuse for not being faithful to Christ. There is no good excuse. While the door is still open, enter in. Number six. In the end, we pass judgment on ourselves. Stop. Did you catch that? The people that chose to not get in the ark couldn't point their finger at God and say, you are the reason why I didn't go on. No, friend. I left the door open for you. They passed judgment on themselves when they made the choice not to go in. In the end, we pass judgment on ourselves. By the consistent quality of our personal day-to-day -day choices, we are now deciding or sealing our eternal destiny. A godly character is made up of thousands of individual choices which we are now making in response to the Holy Spirit's prompting. And as we say no to him and we give our excuses, 
we are involved in the process of the unpardonable sin. Now, if you're worried about having committed it, you haven't done it yet. If that worries you, if that freaks you out, you're not there yet. But there are people, when they're there, they don't even think about this anymore. And eventually we will get there if we keep saying no to that gentle voice prompting us. I'm just being upfront with you, gang. You know, I may, get, I may be killed on the way home today. This may be my last sermon. I plead with all here, do not toy with sin. It will destroy you. It will destroy you. Call it for what it is and run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. <clears throat> Let's take a look at number seven. At no point in time, either at conversion, during our Christian lives, or at the judgment, does God act arbitrarily to override or manipulate our power of choice. The decisions of heaven's court are not arbitrary. It is our decision that determines the verdict. Heaven simply recognizes them. At the judgment, God takes note of the current quality of our commitment, our current orientation of heart and will, and places a seal of confirmation upon the lifestyle or character that we have consistently chosen. God's verdict in the judgment simply discloses and vindicates the quality and direction of our habitual personal choices. I want to ask you a question. Is God to fear in the judgment? Who are we to fear? Next, look at the note. These considerations should not rob us of the quiet assurance that all Christians may have. They only protect us from the false assurance of resting comfortably in a relationship that has never existed or one that we have since lost. Number 16. When the investigative judgment is done, what verdict is reached? Revelation 22, 10 to 14 says, He who is unjust, let him be what? Unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be what? Filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be what? Righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and uh, my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. What this text is actually showing us is the close of probation. You see, when you and I were born, we were placed on probation. We have a choice. When we accept Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity now to be prepared to go to heaven with him if we cooperate with him, if we call sin by its right name. I want to share something with you. There isn't a person in this room that can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Sin is stronger than, than any of us and all of us. But what we need is Christ to help us, to give us the power and the desire. Is that right? Absolutely. Let's look at the next verse. This is a very interesting verse, by the way. By the way, uh, in that one in Revelation, you notice it says unjust and just, filthy uh, and righteous. Uh, you, you know, what we're seeing here is that uh, we're looking at opposite ends of a spectrum. So what's happening, my friends, is that the world is moving in two different directions. I remember when I was teaching or I was a, a student teacher and I was observing uh, a classroom. I'm the type of person I like to pick people's brains. Drives my kids crazy. Um, but I like to pick people's brain. And, and we were in this, this class and I learned that the teacher was about to retire. He had, he had taught for like 35 years or something. And I thought, ooh, well, that brother has a lot of experience. So I got him alone and I, I pulled him aside and I said, you know, I want to ask a question for you. From when you first started teaching to now, what is the biggest difference you have seen in your field? And he said to me, he didn't even flinch. He said, the good kids are getting better and the bad kids are getting worse. And that's what's happening in our world. We're either beholding Christ and we're getting better or we're beholding the things of Satan and we're getting worse. Listen to me, friends. If you're watching the devil's music, if you're listening to the devil's music and you're watching the devil's programming, you are being programmed to be like the devil. You have a choice to make. I'm not going to show up at your house and make you change your channels. God isn't either. But if you want to be like Jesus, you've got to get into the things that belong to Jesus. We all have a choice to make. Everybody in this room. I've made mine. Everybody's got to make theirs. All right. The next verse is Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Right? Remember? When he died, all our sins were placed on him and he took him into the sanctuary. Remember? If, if you're with me, say amen. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 
to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. Oh, wait a second. What is that saying? Remember that when the high priest went, I mean, remember when Christ went to heaven, he bore our sins. But when he leaves, remember when the high priest left the sanctuary after cleansing it? What did he do with all those sins? He placed them on Azazel. So when this text is saying when Jesus returns to get us, that event already took place. And the sins have already placed on Azazel. The sanctuary is cleansed. The people of God are cleansed. It's time to bring them home. How cool is that? That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So what we're experiencing here is what we learn in the most holy place, which is glorification, which is victory over the presence of sin. Let's look at the note right below 16. It says the removal of sin from the sanctuary is the final act of the sanctuary service. Thus, when Jesus' work and the investigative judgment is done, the destiny of all would have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended and Jesus returns for his children. Now, mind you, when everything's been decided, who decided it? We did. The people of God are seeking victory today, my friends. And there are others that don't want it. And they're making their decision. At the end, everybody makes their decision. There's nothing left for Jesus to do in the sanctuary in heaven. You know, out of business. And he comes home to to get his children. Let's take a look at number 17, our last question. Is Jesus able to secure my case before the heavenly court? Somebody here might be thinking that. Yes, he can, friend. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now, what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now let me ask, how often? Daily. Every day. Victory is never something Jesus gives us apart from himself. It is him. It is him. Your response to Jesus. The Savior invites you to turn your life over to him today. Won't you place your trust in God's word and choose Jesus as your caring Savior, friend, attorney, and judge in the judgment? What's your answer? You know, I I just want to end by saying this. You know, there may be somebody here whose sin really has a hold on them. It could be cigarettes. It could be pornography. It could be it could be an adulterous relationship. It could be working on the Sabbath. It could be anything. Friends, fall before Jesus on your knees. Ask Christ not only for forgiveness, but ask him to give you victory. And then commit yourself every day to spend time with Christ in his word. And, and I love the book Steps to Christ. Get into the little book Steps to Christ. We have a ton of them. If you want one, come see me or one of the elders or deaconesses or our secretary. We'll be happy to put one in your hand. Another book is uh, Desire of Ages, The Life of Christ. The reason I share these things with you is because that's what I got into for God to set me free. And he'll do it. I'm going to ask our chorister if she'll come up. I want you to open your hymn books to hymn number 297, God Be Merciful to Me. This hymn is really special to me. Um, The hymn is actually derived from Psalms 51. And if you have never, if you don't know what Psalms 51 is about, David wrote this after his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and after he murdered her husband and he was confronted with his own sin. And this, this, he, he began to realize the enormity of what he had done, and he was asking God for forgiveness. Friend, I don't know where you are today, but I'm so thankful for this hymn. It means a lot to me. I pray it means a lot to you. And know that God is ready and willing and able to forgive you and to sustain you. If that's what you want, he'll do it for you. It's what he wants. So if you would, please stand, and then we'll close uh, with prayer. God be merciful to me, on thy grace I rest my plea, plant us in compassion thou, blot out my transgressions now, wash me, make me pure within, cleanse, O oh, cleanse me from my sin. Wash me, make me pure within. Cleanse, oh, cleanse me from my sin. 
I am evil, born in sin. Thou desirest truth within. Thou alone, my Savior, art. Teach thy wisdom to my heart. Make me pure, thy grace bestow. Wash me whiter than the snow. Make me pure, thy grace bestow. Wash me whiter than the snow. Gracious God, my heart renew. Make my spirit right and true. Cast me not away from Thee. Let Thy Spirit dwell in me. Thy salvation's joy impart. Steadfast make my willing heart. Thy salvation's joy impart. Steadfast make my willing heart. Sinners then shall learn from me and return, O God, to Thee. Savior, all my guilt remove and my tongue shall sing Thy love. Touch my silent lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall praise the chord. Touch my silent lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall praise the chord. Congregation, did God forgive David? And he will forgive us too. Every head is bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven. Lord, the judgment is underway. But the judgment, Lord, settles in favor of the saints. The judgment is for us. You're not trying to find a way to keep us out of heaven. You're desperately trying to get us in. Your biggest obstacle is not the devil. It's us. Oh God, help us to recognize that we will never see things for what they are unless we spend time with you in your word and in prayer. That you cannot help us if we excuse sin, make excuses, if we make sin, sin a form of convenience. You can never touch, you have no jurisdiction. You can only touch the sin that we acknowledge as being sinful and ask you to enter in to deal with it. Lord, we want you to do whatever needs to be done to make us like your son. We want to be a citizen of heaven here so we can be a citizen of heaven there. Now, Father, there are some here in this room whom you have been tapping on the shoulder for some time to spend time with you. There are some in this room you've been tapping on the shoulder for some time to give up something that is standing between you and them and will destroy them. And so if there's a soul here that that describes, that there's been something you've been keeping God away, you've been keeping him at arm's length, Today, you want to make the decision now of giving him full jurisdiction into that situation to call it sin for what it is and to make every effort within your part to get away from it, trusting that God will provide the power. If that describes you today, if you'll just raise your hand where you're at, every eye is closed. Lord Jesus, you see the hands. We present them to you. Thank you for your faithfulness and for the assurance that you will never lose a case that is trusted to you. In Jesus' name we do pray this. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. International copyright, all rights reserved. Free listening of this message and over 7,000 other presentations by more than 100 speakers on 50 different topics is now available on our American Christian Ministries mobile app for Android and Apple devices and on our secure website. You may also order presentations online at AmericanChristianMinistries.org or call 800-233-4450.
Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help to prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.